Now I'd like to welcome to the show Travis Fisher, Director of Energy and Environmental Policy Studies at the Cato Institute here in Washington, D.C. Welcome to Free the Economy, Travis. Thank you. Great to be here. All right. So we talk a lot about energy here on the podcast. Uh, you know, we like to call, uh, like Julian's, like the econ- economist Julian Simon did, we like to call energy the, uh, uh, the master resource. It makes a lot of everything else in, uh, in society and in our economy possible. Uh, and we also often complain about the rules and regulations uh, that producing and deploying new energy sources are subject to. Um, but it's less often we get a chance to talk to someone who's actually worked on the other side of the issue. So my question to you, to start with, what's it like coming from a background where you've been at places like Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or the Department of Energy? And what's it like now to be a kind of policy advocate, someone who's in the nonprofit and think tank world? Yeah, I've seen the dark side. That's a great question. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually started, so I started my career as an intern at the John Locke Foundation, very free market state level think tank in Raleigh. And one of my advisors at the at that point said, well, you know, we always complain about government doing too much or, you know, you don't want the regulatory state to overreach and all of that stuff. And the, the question at the time was because I had a job offer from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, was doing a lot of hiring at the time, which I think tied back to the Energy Policy Act of 2005. So this is the spring of 2006. And the question was, do you stay in just the think tank? I don't want to say just the think tank space. Do you stay in the think tank space or do you get your hands dirty and go into the the belly of the beast? And uh, I chose the latter. And I think it was it was a good It definitely was good experience because the hands-on experience, I think, was different from the way that I hear folks talk about it. It's almost like, well, the government just wants more power, more control, more. And, you know, that might be true in sort of an abstract sense, but it's always it's always more complicated than that. I found a lot of really good, hardworking people, a lot of legitimate public servants and I think that has sort of shaped my my views a bit and has given me a more positive approach to, you know, if you want to change policy, it's not only that you want fewer of these folks, which I think is fair to say we have a bloated federal workforce, but acknowledge that they are doing important work. And at the very least, if you want, you know, to close down an agency or you want them to do less, then the question is, do you do you have a plan for who's going to pick up the you know the worthwhile things that they were doing um so that 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 has been a much more interesting layer to add to it and instead of just the approach that like oh let's just shut it all down which don't get me wrong i have days where that is the exact feeling mm-hmm. that i feel is <laughs> let's just let's just close this whole federal enterprise but i i think the and the other side of that is the technical expertise there are some things that you know FERC is a great example. It's it's an independent agency, ostensibly independent, um, does a lot of highly technical work. So I'm not sure how else you would get that expertise without going straight for it or, or doing like a FERC practice at, at a, a law firm would, would, would be the other example. But it's really detailed technical work that you, that you basically have to do in a hands-on way to learn. So speaking of seeing things from a different perspective, I wonder if you think there are things that uh, that get misunderstood by the public in general when it comes to you know how we produce energy in the United States, and uh, because obviously any any policymaker, any politicians, if they are you know if they have the idea of putting any uh, reforms on the way energy is produced in America, they have to deal with public opinion. But of course, if the if the public is uh, sort of misguided about how things exist in the first place, then that obviously creates a problem for anyone trying to uh, put together a solution for uh, tomorrow. So is there, are there topics out there that you think that like the average person, simply because they're not an expert, of course, uh, sort of doesn't quite get about how we, how we keep the lights on? I think step one is understanding that um, your electricity doesn't just come from the outlet and your wall. I think uh, I was certainly guilty of that until, you know, I started to study this stuff. I just didn't really know that much about it. Sort of had a general idea. You can see power lines and things like that. So if you're on the road, you see like a giant transmission line, think, well, that's that's the grid. Um, so so people's personal experience with it, especially on, on the electricity side, 
it's not really that in depth. I mean, unless you go on a you know, tour of a power plant, you don't really know how it works. But that's the one thing that I would point to is when people think it's that easy, if it's just the thing that comes out of your outlet, then reforms to it should be easy too. Um, <clears throat> so if you don't understand the full complexity of the system, then it becomes easy as a talking point to say, well, let's just do wind, solar, batteries, blah, blah, blah. You can sort of fill in the blank with the thing that you like, which is, I think, what politicians get away with because people don't really have a deep understanding of you know, the, the complexity of the system. So if you think it's a simple system, it's simple to change. If you recognize that it's a very complex system, you realize that in order to make sweeping changes, uh, even if you think that's the right policy, uh, the details matter. And I I don't think, you know, if, if it's the average voter saying, yeah, I like green stuff, um, there's there's just so much more to it than that. <clears throat> well, I know I was thinking about this, uh, you know, I mentioned this in the uh, podcast this week as well, that uh, the American Nuclear Society had their uh, meeting here, their, their winter meeting here in Washington, D.C. And so there were a lot of experts, and a lot of people talking about nuclear energy. Uh, but they also had a big session where they had uh, policymakers. So they had, uh, among other people, uh, West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. And uh, Manchin was talking about how obviously West Virginia is famous as a big coal producing state. Um, and, and that is probably going to be changing as, uh, the, uh, as the years roll on. And uh, there are opportunities to take old coal energy producing uh, plants and stick in nuclear using the same infrastructure and that this is one of these sort of like transitional things that they're trying to plan for. Um, but what I thought was interesting uh, about, you know, people understanding like where the electricity comes from, it comes out, comes out of the wall, uh, is that, you know, if you have a, an EV or if you have, uh, you know, you're like driving a Tesla in West Virginia, um, that's not really an electric powered car so much as it's a coal powered car. Right, because currently that the electricity that's coming <laughs> to power your EV is coming from a coal-fired power plant, um, and I I think a lot that might surprise a lot of people, <laughs> because they they assume that like electric vehicles, for example, are this you know new green climate conscious environmentally friendly uh, technology, um, but they don't necessarily think about how those different parts of the system go together. I saw a custom license plate on a Tesla that said coal power. And I thought that was hilarious. That I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, the if if you're going all electric in the case of transportation or in the case of home appliances, all of that stuff, if you don't like your gas stove, you want to go, you know, if 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 you want to electrify everything is is sort of the catchphrase. If you want to do that, uh, and you think it's the environmentally friendly thing to do. It does depend entirely on what's producing that power in the first place. So the primary energy source is, you know, is is the real key there. Um, yeah, sometimes it's coal. Our biggest source of electricity in the U.S. right now is gas. So, um, you know, if you if you don't like fracking, you're you know you're you're driving a a fracked gas car in a lot of cases. So uh, it is that second level of sort of understanding where things come from. Um, hugely important. Um, and I'm not sure, I mean, probably your, your Tesla driver is, is probably going to be a little bit more educated on that stuff than average, but I'm not sure. I, I still see a whole lot of, well, it's just like a, a feel good kind of a thing and you don't really scrutinize the details. Well, yeah. And so we're looking, you know, we look at this whole broad sweep of energy environment issues today. You know, we really have two major concerns. And I think some people on of one ideological orientation sort of forget the other or pay less attention to the other, which is, you know, how do we produce enough energy so that it is reliable and affordable for people so we can power stuff, so we can keep the lights on? Um, and how do we do it in a way that we can have manageable impacts on the environment, right? We're really concerns about whether it's uh, emissions in the air that you breathe in or things like parts per million of carbon dioxide, people worried about climate change. To what extent, and there's been a lot of argument back and forth about whether these are uh, inherently conflicting goals or a lot of people have come along and said, oh, actually there's no conflict because we've sort of created this magic policy solution that's win, win, win. So there's no, there's no conflict at all, forget about it. Um, in, the, in the long term, and you know, the 
are coming up to the, the next uh, United Nations um, uh, Climate Summit, the Conference of the Parties, uh, where people will be talking a lot about uh, stuff like this on a sort of economy-wide level, on a policy level, is this a major conflict or we can can we sort of just finesse it with technology, like having enough electricity for everybody, but also having manageable environmental impacts? I'd like to get back to a market test. So when, when folks talk about sort of their favorite technologies and it's usually something like, oh, well, we should use the existing grid and we've already got the sort of the transmission and the substations for the coal plant. So let's just put nuke on the same site. That's probably what the the mansion approach was was hinting at mm -hmm. um i think the real question is oh let's just let the market decide and we are so far from doing that there's uh you know most states it's something like 30 states now have mandates for specific types of technology you know that they you know these are renewable portfolio standards um i, I prefer to call them energy mandates but so there's a lot of that at the state level um Joe Manchin also gets credit for uh, helping pass the Inflation Reduction Act, which basically doubles and triples down on this idea that the, the federal government should subsidize, should sort of pick winners through direct subsidy. Um, so you have both of those going on at the same time. I think the only way to figure out what's going to work and what is actually in conflict with a healthy economy versus not is just to, you know, to actually have a, a, a market test for all this stuff. And we're so far removed from that, that it's hard to tell, like, you, you know, you have some folks that would speculate, well, wind and solar, the costs have come down so much that all we have to do is let them win in the marketplace. And I'm sympathetic to that. I would say, great. This is great news. Let's, let's remove the subsidies and they'll just win. So that's, that's great for all of us. So that would be an example of not being in conflict. The huge conflict that I see is, I mean, the cost of the the IRA is going to be staggering. I've read some materials that, especially if you go out beyond sort of the 10-year budget window, because uh, that, that's where the, the estimates are already different because there's so many different variables. But it's something like a trillion dollars in the first decade. But then what happens after that? Uh, I, think, I think the trillions keep coming, about a trillion a decade. So it depends how long we allow it to stay on the books, but, you know, we're, we're so far removed from this idea that we even know what the market would, would do. You can guess, but uh, with, with the policies that, that we have on the books, it's really hard to tell sort of which, which technologies are more consistent with a market-based approach. All right. And to go back to uh, the inflation reduction act, this big giant sprawling piece of legislation, where it involved, and, and, and Senator Manchin uh, uh, recently was, was talking about this as well, where he said, you know, that Manchin, uh, you know, is Democrat, but he's famous for being the most conservative Democrat, the most like Republican adjacent Democrat. Um, you know, he said in this uh, big, you know, main stage interview in front of the conference that the Inflation Reduction Act for him was supposed to be about, uh, you know, deficit reduction and, uh, being pro-energy and that the Biden administration had gone out and the Democrats had sold it out as an environmental bill. Uh, and so that, that he said, that made my Republican friends very angry, right? Uh, so that it was sort of, you know, left-wing coded rather than right-wing coded to, you know, put it in like, you know, sociological terms. Um, and so he, you know, in, in his view, it was very, you know, very responsible thing to do. And, and there was supposed to be a couple hundred billion dollars of deficit reduction that came, came out of the IRA. Um, but like you said, subsequent, analyses on what the actual fiscal impact is going to be in long term have suggested that actually it's going to be uh, uh, a huge add massively uh, to the deficit and and so obviously that changes dramatically what what you think about the bill right if, if, if it was the sort of compromise that was passed saying well we're going to give some subsidies to renewable energy but we're also going to uh, to cut back on the deficit at the same time with these other provisions. And then you find out, oh wait, no, actually <laughs> it does the exact opposite. Then that puts us in a different position about whether we think it's a good idea or not, you know, on top of all the other specific provisions that we may like, may like or not like. But one of the reasons why it was it's going to be so expensive long-term is that these subsidies are sort of uncapped, right? Like they didn't, they didn't say, well, we're going to give everyone who buys a new EV a $5,000 tax credit up to a certain amount. Right. 
Uh, and so if things go go great from the perspective of, of the sponsors and we get uh, more EVs and more charging stations and more all this more of the stuff that's being subsidized, well, that's more subsidy money that the, the federal government is going to have to deal with. Yeah, that's right. Some provisions do expire, I believe. The one that I'm most concerned about is the one that does not expire. So let's keep in mind, too, that this is the same senator who, in a campaign ad, he took a rifle and he shot a hole in the cap and trade bill. And he said he was going to, you know, contain spending in D.C. and all this other stuff. Um, this is the same guy who who pushed that the IRA. So with that context, it really is surprising that he would have supported it. And it makes me wonder if he really got into the details of it, because the main thing that I'm concerned about is the it's called the production tax credit. It's basically you get something approaching the the market price of the commodity. So this is, you know, the 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 unit is dollars per megawatt hour. So if you're a generator, you basically get this subsidy no matter when or where you produce it, it's going to cause lots of problems. And it's open-ended in the sense that it says it's going to end the later of, and it gives two things, the later of the year 2032, which I think got a lot of people thinking that it was going to end in 2032, but it's the later of that, or when the electricity grid decarbonizes to a level that's only 25% of the GHG emissions that we had in the year 2022. So based on a whole bunch of different uh scenarios like i just also based on sort of gut level knowledge especially if we if we're creating a world where we're going to put a lot of different things including evs and home fuel use and all of that stuff on the grid we're only going to in increase the amount of electricity we use the idea that we can lower the level of ghg emissions to that i don't i don't think that's feasible so this is just a wide open never ending tax credit scheme that I think is going to end up pouring if 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 we don't change it it's going to end up pouring you know two three four trillion dollars at this so that's the other thing if if you if you bought into the IRA because you thought it was actually going to reduce inflation and you thought it was going to constrain spending it's the exact opposite and you know the the original scoring was something like only 300 and something billion dollars for for green energy I think it's 10 times that and the more people wrap their minds around that and say, wow, this is not only not reducing the deficit, it's, you know, it's a wide open, it's not just a handout, but it's just a staggering amount of money. Yeah. And that you're, I feel like you're sort of hinting at, at, at something that, you know, has, has come up a lot in these conversations as well, which is the, the electrify everything idea that we're going to take, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to take all the things that, uh, are now powered by, uh, you know, hydrocarbon energy, which is gasoline-powered vehicles and things like, you know, even things like electric stoves, unnatural gas, or uh, natural gas stoves moving to electric. Uh, that is going to increase demand on our on our electrical grid uh, dramatically, right? If you if you electrify every single vehicle in America, um, even just every passenger vehicle, you know, leaving out the you know the heavy trucks and everything, uh, you would need. A massive expansion of America's electrical grid and more transmission lines and things, but those things are very difficult to build and permit. That they, they yep. they're expensive and they're long term, and because of the uncertainty and whether they're going to be permitted or not, it's difficult to line up financing for them. Um, you could take, you know, <clears throat> and you could build, you could potentially create a development project to build a plant. Uh, you know, especially something like, you know, a wind or solar plant. But if it's not near the place where the population center where the electricity is going to be needed, then you need these like high power uh, transmission lines. And those, especially over state lines, are also very difficult to, to build. And the process of getting through, you know, legal review can be very long and complicated. So, you know, I wonder, is there going to be a kind of reality moment? Is there going to be like kind of reality train wreck at some point where we have our decarbonization goals and we're pushing more and more stuff on the grid, but the grid's not being upgraded fast enough to handle it? What's going to happen? So I don't like to make predictions, but th this one seems fairly certain to happen in some fashion. What's going to happen, I believe, is so some folks already see this. We're going to need a lot of transmission, a lot of new transmission. If the big if, if you actually want to do this wind and solar transition, 
you need transmission. I have a friend who says there's no transition without transmission. I mean, it's it's catchy and it it makes perfect sense because the places where you can site a large solar farm, a large wind farm, those aren't really close to where people use energy. So you need a line to to transmit it. I mean, that's just that's basic. But then the question is, well, can you even do that? And can you do it in time? And at what cost? And all of these questions, I think, need to be fleshed out. I think that's sort of the, you know, to to go back to the idea that, well, if it's a simple system, it's easy to transform. It's not a simple system, and it's very complex to transform. And it includes things like the rights of way. Do you need new rights of way? Do you have to basically clear cut through existing property lines? How do you do that? Can you do it without an eminent domain authority? Then all of a sudden, it's, well, you're building overhead transmission lines. And some people are arguing that you should get the same eminent domain authority that you get to basically for, for gas pipelines that end up getting buried. And these are really sticky policy questions. And then the other one is who pays for it? Even if we can agree on how much it's going to cost, there's the cost allocation question of sort of, is this a federal government enterprise? Should taxpayers have to pay for it? Do we allocate it to electricity customers? And then it's, you know, th- there's, all of these questions, but it's just, I think there is going to be a moment when the sort of simplicity and the allure of something like you can just say it really easily, net zero by 2050. It's such an easy thing to say up front, but actually carrying it out, carrying it through is going to be so messy and so expensive that I wonder if people are going to start saying, I know I said I liked net zero by 2050. I know, or a company, you know, there's all these company pledges and states have their own policies that say we're going to be zero carbon or carbon neutral by 2050. As that date gets closer and closer, and keep in mind, transmission lines can take upwards of 10 years to even be put in service. Once you figure out all the details of where to plan it and where to site it and all that stuff, it's still a, a really lengthy process. So then the question is, are people going to be able to elegantly drop or maybe do a uh, a soft pivot from the original goal? And we've already seen some people say, yeah, we still like net zero, but maybe maybe push the year out a little bit. That's the kind of thing that I'm going to see. I, I that that's the if I can make a prediction that I feel decently confident about that it's going to be something like that. We're we're going to have to change our minds because the 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 goal I don't think was ever a good one in the first place. But I think as people realize sort of the details of how we get there, how expensive it's going to be, how complicated. Um, here, here's a great example. The state of California is somewhat of a leading indicator here where they've gone farther with their transition. They're very heavy on solar. So then the question is, do we get to use electricity when we want to, or do we get to use electricity when it's available from an intermittent resource? That is going to take a shift too. And my sense is that people are not going to be welcoming of that shift. People in California where the weather's nice and if they're well off enough, maybe they can even self-generate, who knows. But when it gets to be, I don't know, freezing outside, and the question is, can you run your electric heater or not? I don't think people are going to say, well, the wind's not blowing, so I have to do what I have to do. I think people are going to say, I want electricity when I want it, and I, I'm not going to bend to this new paradigm. So that it's, it's something like that. Some that's going to force a lot of interesting conversations. Well, yeah, I mean, based on the the sort of paths and projections we have for these goals, based on like you said, the you know the the ten years it might take to you know build a new transmission line. Um, <clears throat> you know, it seems like a crack up could be could be coming sooner rather than later. And like, you know, you point out certainly in Southern California, weather is very mild, right? Um, but, you know, we had record winter uh, snowfall in Northern California and the Sierra Nevada mountains aren't, aren't, aren't known for their mild climate, especially in, in the winter time. And even a place uh, like Texas, if you were going to like slot all the states uh, in this country into like hot states and cold states, Texas would probably be a hot state, but when they had a winter uh, energy crisis, uh, dozens of people died. So even in a place that uh, we generally think of as 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 not a, a freezing cold place, can have really big impacts if they don't have energy reliability um, in extreme weather. So you know this. It also makes me uh, think of 
you know, like you said, making making predictions and stuff, but you know, this is what people are sort of interested in. Well, like what what comes next in uh in Congress, we we seem to be pretty uh uh evenly split, right? We've got a very evenly split both House and Senate, uh tiny majorities on either side. Um but that is probably going to change to at least some extent after the next election. You know, what is your your sort of crystal ball, you know, imagine we have, you know, some kind of Republican majority uh, and we've got a policy path. What do you think a, ma a Republican majority would do on these issues? And what do you think uh, a Democratic majority would do? And how far apart are those? I think in my issue area, in terms of the energy and environmental policy, it's, right, yeah. it's pretty much day and night. I mean, it. Uh, so what the Democrats would like to do I think is go even further. So we saw what they did with the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I think they would like something even further, something like a national clean energy standard was was one idea that was on the table. Um, when they were forced to basically go the budget reconciliation route, they realized that sort of the the true sweeping policies were off the table. It had to be a financial tool. It had to be a subsidy. Um, so I think if they ever got to either a 60 vote majority in the Senate, you would see something even more sweeping. And you would see things like, I think a carbon tax on top of everything we already have. And you would see very little resistance and maybe even a uh, a bill in Congress that would explicitly do what the EPA is doing now. Um, and I think what the EPA is doing now is illegal and is essentially, we, we haven't really talked about it, but their their new power plant rule, this is very similar to what they tried to do starting in 2015. They called it the clean power plan back then. Uh, they don't really give it a cute name this time, but it's very similar. And it was struck down by the Supreme Court. I think if there were a legislative directive to do exactly what EPA is doing, it would be upheld. The problem with the EPA, what the EPA is doing now is it's taking a you know, a statute from the 70s and saying, ah, aha, we found something new we can do here in this old statute. Uh, we're going to remake the economy with the, you know, with the Clean Air Act. Um, so I would expect something like that from Democrats. Now, um, from Republicans, I I wish that I could be more optimistic. I, you know, of course, they would do something different. My personal experience, especially going back to the 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 Trump administration at the DOE in 2017, it wasn't a let's unleash the markets. It was the closest you got to that was on the LNG export question. So we wanted to export gas everywhere. And that that was uh that was the closest you got to sort of a pure market approach. Uh when it came to the US electric grid, it was more of like, well, how do we, you know, the the key word was resilience, but really it was a it was a how do we keep coal plants running? Um even when it doesn't make sense to do that. So what, what I what I would like to see is a return to sort of a free market approach, uh, a, a capitalist, a free enterprise approach, which you would hope for from the right. But um, in practice, it depends who it is and what their priorities are. It could be that they actually like the idea of either bailing out an industry, which I think is a terrible idea, or um, we've seen a proposal. This is a Senator Cassidy proposal to basically institute, you know, he's calling it a foreign pollution fee, but it's basically a carbon tax. That's uh, it's it's an import tariff that's that's built on sort of a carbon intensity question. Um, so that's the kind of stuff we're seeing from the right as of today. So I I, I kind of wish they would uh, trend in a more free market direction, but uh, honestly, it's I'm 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 not sure anymore. Well, you know, there's one thing about uh, that. That description that uh, sort of uh, tr triggered the back of my brain, which is the idea that, uh, uh, you know, say if Democrats had a big majority, they would pass a carbon tax. And uh, as you said, on top of everything else. Uh, and it's one of these things that comes up a lot in um, people's sort of prognostications and they're theorizing about uh, public policy about, you know, we, you know, we can solve this big problem and Congress can do X, Y and Z. And and they get they get really excited about uh, proposing these like theoretical policy swaps and big grand deals and things like that. Um, so it, it, it's in things like you know P 
people who want a universal basic income, you know, and they say, well, we'll have a, we'll get, everyone will have a universal basic income, but we'll get rid of all the, like, all the existing um, welfare programs, right? And it'll be this big swap and it'll be the, the sort of thing that, you know, political science students write papers about and it'll be grand bargain. Cool. Yeah, grand, the grand bargain. And so people have said this for, for years, going back a long time. You have had, you know, libertarians, free market people that said, well, maybe we should have a carbon tax, but we'll get rid of everything else, whatever, you know, they're a little vague on what, what all that would be. Um, they're like, oh, we'll like abolish every other environmental restriction, right? And we'll just have a carbon tax and then everyone will be happy with that. Um, you know, my uh, my objection to those sort of like grand bargain proposals is um, one, they won't work. <laughs> one, they'll never get passed in the first place. Uh, but two, even if in some sort of fantasy world, you had both sides agree to such a swap, the things that were swapped away would just get repassed and re-implemented because there was a constituency for and an incentive for them in the first place. And the, the grand bargain wouldn't remove those incentives for them coming into existence in the first place. So it wouldn't stop them from recoming back into existence. Um, that's that's my version of this. Um, you know, do you think there's any sort of like bargain potential there? Like, you know, can we, you know, do we like repeal the National Environmental Policy Act, but we'll have a, you know, a $20 per ton carbon tax instead? Is that, is that a thing? Most of these bargains that I hear about, I I like the one side of it, like repeal NEPA. I'm, you know, if that's going to boost the economy, let's just do that. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I have heard this argument that wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be simpler if we just did a carbon tax or it's, you know, they usually use different language now. Wouldn't it be simpler to, sim to simply price carbon and remove the regulations, the subsidies, the mandates, um, even if I bought into that in principle, and I'm not sure I do because there's all sorts of details about the carbon tax that make it problematic. Like how do you establish the level? Um, usually folks just say, well, you tax it at whatever amount makes it go away. Like that's not exactly the Pagovian approach <laughs> to carbon tax. But the point you bring up is incredibly valid. And it's actually a piece that I have just started writing, which is if we wanted to enumerate the list of things that you would need to trade in to make a carbon tax make sense on economic efficiency grounds. So that's all the regulations. That's the whole EPA paradigm. There's everything from DOE energy efficiency standards that have sort of a, a carbon emissions, you know, justification behind them. Um, even if you wanted to do that at the federal level, I think it's really difficult. And a lot of the stuff, you know, if, if there's some element of even a FERC policy that has a, a, a carbon motivation behind it, then you're asking an independent agency to do something. And that that's not exactly the kind of thing that you can just do in a sweeping fashion. All of those details aside, that's just federal level. That's the easiest part. Then the question is, do you address everything that happens at the state level? So these are all these state mandates that we've already talked about. Then even further, do you get into building codes? There's all these green building codes. Well, you don't need those anymore if you price carbon because then everything just falls into place. Um, so I am completely with you in the sense that I don't even think they get repealed in the first place. Even if you pass a bill that says we swear we're going to try to we're going to try our best to repeal all this stuff, I just don't see it happening at all. I see this as a complete pancaking exercise that it just comes on top of everything else, which is part of the reason I I don't like the the Cassidy approach with the carbon tariff is it I think it walks us right into this paradigm of first the tariff, then attacks on us within the U.S. And then all of it is just on top of what the EPA is doing, which we haven't gone into those details, but the gist is they're outlawing, they've already outlawed new coal plants. They're essentially outlawing the most efficient type of gas plant. This is a combined cycle plant that it's one of the most beautiful designs that I've ever seen is you have up front, you have a, you know, something like a, a jet engine. It's just a turbine that runs on gas that, that's, that spins the turbine. That's its own generator. And then you have maybe two or three of those operating. They generate a lot of heat, significant amount of heat. So then what you can do is take the heat from those generators. Then you sort of, you have a, a steam function. So you, you use that heat, you run a separate steam generator, which used to be the old school way to, to have a gas plant. It was just the steam part. Um, but, but the combined cycle unit is the most efficient way to generate the electricity that we've ever come up with. EPA has just proposed to ban it. I think people should be losing their minds over this. So it's it's stuff like that where I'm like, I, you know, 
if that went away, that would be great. But I don't see a world where the environmentalists say, uh, yeah, that whole plan that we just came up with that we spent years on. Yeah, let's just throw that in the trash and we'll 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 just we'll just do the carbon tax. So I, I really, you know, as much as people want to talk about a grand bargain, and I will engage in that conversation to see what exactly is on the table. I'm happy to engage in that conversation. I'm very skeptical that anybody would want to come to the table and especially on the environmental left side. And, and actually, it, especially when it comes to this, you know, the if the grand bargain includes permitting reform, if it includes making it easier to build gas pipelines, can you imagine somebody saying, yes, let's make it easier to build gas pipelines because we have a carbon tax now and it makes sense. Uh, we're already at the optimal level because of the carbon tax. So why not build the gas pipelines? I just can't fathom it. I, I would I would welcome that conversation. I just can't fathom it. All right. Well, <clears throat> it sounds like we might have to settle for small bargains from <laughs> going forward. Um, or I, what we're re what we're really settling with is knife fights at the regulatory agency <laughs> level, uh, which again, I guess that's what I'm here for. I'm very happy to do it, but um, yeah, I, I just don't, I just can't see a grand bargain right now. Okay, well, we'll we'll get to work on those regulatory comments. Uh, Travis, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, before we go, uh, let people know where they can uh, find you and your uh, your material online. So I just started a Substack so that people can find what I post on the Cato blog more easily. Yes. That's travisfisher.substack.com. Uh, I am on X. I somewhat regret having a presence on that platform, but uh, <laughs> it's mostly it's mostly good for sharing ideas. It's at ts underscore fisher. Find my work at cato.org. Uh, I think I think that's about it. I also I you know. I have an open door policy. If folks want to engage on 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 policy issues, I'm I'm always happy to do that. 